Hey, this is Mark A. Altman. This is Darren Docterman, and we are the Inglorious Trexperts. See, I thought it was a classic femme fatale. Just so much fun. I like that Shakespearean lace in your acting. I said, Gene, what do you want from this character? I want you to just take the character and make it your own. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good time on the film. On day one, the movie was already $15 million over budget. We started this movie without an ending. That's like painting yourself into a corner. I don't think we've ever had a Star Trek oh, captain on our true. show. Being, as you said, number one of the, on the call sheet, it is a producer's position if you're going to take it seriously. I was so glad they didn't cast me as Lorca. <laughs> <laughs> You famously wrote that script in 12 days. On one level, I wrote the script, and on another level, the story was written by everybody and sure. his brother. New episodes every Saturday, wherever you listen to podcasts, or download the Electric Now app. Keep on trekking. Ingloriously, of course. This is Mark A. Altman. And this is Darren Dockerman, and we are the Inglorious Trexperts. And you are watching Comic Con at Home and a special episode of Inglorious Trexperts where we're going to be talking about the 30th anniversary, 30th anniversary of the best of both worlds, arguably the greatest episode of Star Trek The Next Generation ever. And, be and because it's Comic Con at Home, I have my dealer's room set up right over here. So come on by and buy lots of stuff yeah that sounds that sounds like uh that's sounds like fun i i think i'll do that sounds like fun <laughs> and joining us for our own little comic con is uh ashley miller the writer of such films as thor and x-men first class he's been a writer producer on shows like lore and terminator the sarah connor chronicles and is working on a new netflix series as we speak and uh welcome back ashley edward miller you know, thank you for having me. I, I will say there is one big difference, aside from the obvious, between this and an actual Comic-Con panel. You're sober. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, man, I can't tell you. I mean, I don't want to, obviously, we're here to talk about Best of Both Worlds. And, and Comic-Con 100% did the right thing uh, uh, canceling this year's show. But... Um, I, I miss I miss it I, I I miss it you know I was looking so looking forward to it and um, uh, I miss hanging out in the hotel bars yeah me too because it's not about drinking sometimes it is but mostly it's about hanging with friends who actually know what you're talking about when you talk about stuff like this I have fond memories of the uh, of of remember back at the Marriott where um, I, we all came back uh, from the masquerade I think it was and. Uh, Arena was on in the hotel bar. That's right. They're watching classic track, just having the greatest time. And of course, that's when we met the uh, inimitable Dan Poole, who was regaling us with stories of uh, how his dream in life was to meet Stan Lee because he had just ma made a fan Spider-Man film. And of course, he, he wanted to show it to us. So we went to get, this is how long it was, long ago, we went to get a VCR from his room and Stan Lee walks by. <laughs> oh my God, it's Stan Lee. <laughs> You believe this? And Stanley goes, Excelsior. Excelsior, yes. And then Dan Paul comes back, and, and we're all like laughing. He can't understand why. We, and he, we said, because Stan Lee just walked by. He said, no, you guys are kidding me. You're, you're, you're pranking. And we're like, no, he really did. Yeah. Couldn't believe it. So he, he was stunned. He was upset. He was uh, whatever. We watched this film. He said, I got to go to the bathroom. He goes to the restroom. Sure enough, who comes out of the room and walks by? Stan Lee and it, it was like, oh my god, how could this be happening? It's Stanley goes Excelsior, and we're just like, this is the craziest thing. And uh, we had just so many amazing memories of yeah, and and they're all as wacky as that. Yeah, really, oh, like yeah. year after year. Yeah, I mean everything from yacht parties to masquerade fun to. Uh, uh, all just uh, dinners. I mean, that's where the the infamous phrase uh, "last night we party, tonight we're gonna rage" comes from. Because we went to this dinner of about close to 25, 30 people squeezed into a restaurant, and some guy came along, and I, with a bunch of us who were really close friends, and he decides he's gonna give a toast 
a, a toast. And uh, he stands at the top. Nobody knew who he was. He stands at the head of the table and he holds up a glass and he goes, last night we partied. Tonight we're going to rage. And it's like, who the hell are you? But uh, <laughs> The butters. Of the- we, we uh, you know, over the years, we've just met so many good friends um uh, and 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 made so many enemies no I made so many good friends um and and just it's it's really a remarkable time business more than just a convention it is uh, it's woodstock for geeks it's been called and i think that's that's true without the mud because god we you know geeks we don't like the mud i'd rather go to the, but um but it's it's uh it's it's really a shame but i'm sure comic con will come back bigger and better uh uh, uh next year and and right. Going to be so anxious to return, um, and uh, and it'll be really really special. And hotel prices will be eight hundred dollars a night. <laughs> Can't wait for the social distancing on the uh, on the convention floor. Right, and going from uh, booth to booth. Right, going you from know. three inches to a whopping eight and a half inches. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Like, uh, well, you know, and it's too bad because, of course, you know, now our kids are, you know, Ashley and I are, are, are old enough that they want to go to Comic Con and they want to buy stuff, and you know, it's like the dream has the the, the dreamer has awoken, you know, and and yeah. it's that time, <laughs> no? No, it's like I mean, I remember because after when WonderCon was canceled, my son was like, he had his whole list of stuff he wanted to buy. I said, don't worry, we'll get it Comic Con. So I said, don't worry, we'll get it next year. Um, You're and- a liar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so we're here to talk about the 30th anniversary of the best of both worlds. And we got a really great guest coming up. Uh, Elizabeth Dennehy is going to be joining us, who played the uh, uh, wonderful Commander Shelby. Um, and uh, I didn't realize she was 28 years old and it was one of our first roles when she. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Out. And, uh, you know, you'll hear that she talks a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, she was a little green, but uh, I think it's a just a marvelous performance that she gives. She was, she was awesome in it. And I loved the dynamic that she came in to stir up the pot because, you know, it was the end of the third year. Right. And so we were a little bit um, jaded with how everything was happening on the enterprise. And I think that this new fresh blood coming in to, uh, uh, you know, maybe conflict a little bit with our uh, happy uh, family uh, was a good thing. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that Shelby made that kind of an impression on us? Um, she never came back, but think about some of our favorite guest stars, our mm-hmm. favorite guest officers on Ronnie the Cox. That's right, Jellico, Ensign Rowe, yep. um, Shelby. They're all kind of cut from the same clock. Frankly, I would have watched the Captain Jellico, Commander Shelby. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. But they, they all kind of brought that thing that, you know, on it's uh it's on deep space nine, right. It's like, you know, they, they just would have been a part of the fabric of it, but on the next generation, right. It's their freaks, but like yeah. in, a, in a great way. Um, and I just, I, I can't believe she never came back. Um, uh, and I, I would love to see her be like, uh, you know, freaking Admiral Shelby on Picard. You know, how great would it have been if she had been the admiral who uh, who told Picard to shut the fuck up? That's right. How would've... awesome would that have been? But, alas. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, of course, this is a character that finds its way into a bunch of novels and comic books because everyone loves Shelby. And I think that, you, you know, Ashley, you hit the nail on the head. All these characters have one thing in common. They brought conflict to the show. Uh, on a show that was a, a con- conflict diverse, you know, whether it be Jellico, whether it be Shelby. And the problem is they always felt it had to be a guest star. There could never be conflict between the actual characters. Right. Oh, and I contrast that with something even as mediocre as the Tholian web where, where Kirk, uh, where Kirk is gone and Spock and McCoy are at each other's throats and Kirk sort of um, referees from the grave. And it's great. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and next generation just really, always felt and I loved it we all do love next generation but um, felt that uh, the show uh, the 24th century we had evolved beyond interpersonal conflict and I don't think that's ever going to be and it felt like the drama was shackled somehow by that absolutely yeah. but Roddenberry always insisted that that's how it was supposed to be but you point out the Tholian web which I think was just prima facie evidence that that was never really the case um, but I, I think that, you know, the idea of what Star Trek was evolved in Gene's head as Absolutely. opposed to what it 
actually mm-hmm. was. But it was, right. but again, when you got the best of both worlds, that sense of there's blood in its veins, man, was just amazing. Roddenberry's box didn't really exist until Next Generation. Mm-hmm. Right? Reinventing the myth of Roddenberry because there was never that on the original show. There was plenty of conflict. And I think also his uh, Roddenberry's box, quote unquote, was taken to extremes, especially this is sort of a seminal season for Next Gen because, of course, it began with Michael Wagner, who is just finished Isaac Asimov's short-lived probe series for ABC, uh, being hired to run the show after Maurice Hurley left after sort of the disastrous season two. He had had enough. It was, and that's a whole nother episode. And um, Wagner has basically a nervous breakdown. Uh, can't handle it. Can't do it. And they bring in uh, one of his protégés, a uh, guy who he'd worked with on probe and had formerly been a network censor of standards and practices, Michael Pillar. And Michael to his credit, immediately realized what the show needed. It needed to focus on character. And yes, you know, you could argue that he took Roddenberry's box too seriously, but he also knew instinctively that this was a show that needed to have a character. And even though it fumbled around early in the third season with stuff like Evolution, where Ken Jenkins and Wesley are dealing with a new life form, by the time you get to stuff like uh, Ensign's of Command and Who Watches the Watchers and uh, Data's Day, I mean, the show is kind of firing on all cylinders but i think the show and and brandon talked about this when we had him on too he was just a an intern who had abandoned you know who didn't like star trek and then got talked into watching best of both worlds and that was the show i think that brought people home it was the people who had no interest or who would watch the show early on the first season said this show sucks you know that uh came back and realized wow this show has something to say this show is uh worthy star trek and uh, certainly Best of Both Worlds Part 1 delivers on almost every level. And, I mean, a great villain. And, we, we, you know, we've talked about this before. Uh, introduced, let's not forget, the Borg were introduced in Q-Who, arguably an even better episode the second season. Uh, they were a cyberpunk-inspired villain, but very unique to the Star Trek universe. There never been anything like it. Certainly not the, I mean, the Klingons and... Well, not since Captain EO. Not since Captain EO, but the Klingons and the Romulans were very much admired in sort of Cold War archetypes. Right. And um, the Borg were a kind of 80s, they're very 80s. You know, cyberpunk was huge and William Gibson. And uh, so it was something we'd never seen before in Star Trek. And I, I think there's something to be said that it was sort of a, uh, it had more relation to aliens. I mean, the movie mm-hmm. than uh, anything else we'd seen something that couldn't be reasoned with that was sort of uh, not really animalistic, but definitely uh, the hive mind uh, is something that couldn't be reasoned with. And it was a force of nature. It, you know, I just literally just now had a thought about that episode. I've never had before. Um, and it has to do with this conversation we're having about Shelby, right? And Shelby as this um, uh, force of opposition, right? A source of antagonism. So, in that episode, the Borg never really take on a face other than when they become Locutus. Even then, Locutus still feels like he is a part of that body, right? Um, like he is a part of the storm. But the reason why we have conflict, the reason why I think that we don't think about the facelessness of the Borg is that Shelby comes along. Shelby is an alien invader too. And because she's in that story, it doesn't matter that the Borg don't have a face. And maybe, you know, like, sort of thinking about how the Borg evolved through Star Trek and how it's like, well, we need a queen, which still worked. Um, we need a queen. It's like, or however the hell it got used in, um, in Voyager, as Voyager went on, that, that what it was really missing was, uh, or the reason why the best of both worlds really worked and everything else just didn't quite, was because there wasn't an organic conflict that was happening among the crew um, other than just the conflict that they're having with the Borg. It's like, and maybe right. that's the thing that was missing, that, that Shelby was just as threatening to the crew as the Borg was in its own way. Oh, totally. Interesting. Yeah. I think you can go even deeper because I think, you know, what it does so well is it weaves the A and the B story in a sense that the story is about Riker confronting his future and is he going to abandon Picard? Is he going to abandon the Enterprise to take this command? And then ultimately in the sci-fi story, he has to decide, is he going to abandon, you know, Picard and take command and do what's necessary, even though it's going to lead to the death of his mentor? So character and the sci-fi story merge so perfectly. And, you know, with Next Generation, 
that was a big problem, particularly in the fourth and fifth season where the A and B stories didn't connect at all. And yeah. one might work and one was a total disaster. And then this, it just seamless. But again, the great part about uh, Best of Both Worlds, certainly part one, is that without Shelby's influence, the Enterprise was probably going to be destroyed or, or taken over mm -hmm. because of the way that the, the rut that our crew had been got, getting into, that they weren't ready for it. Yeah. So that's another right. twist on it. Yeah, she was right. And she needed to kick them out of their complacency. Yeah. They were very complacent. And um, I want to ask you guys personally, <laughs> what would, do you recall what your reaction was when you first saw this episode back, you know, 30 years ago? Very Absolutely. Well. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, dude, I was sitting, I remember watching it for the first time, you know, back then, like, you know, a big television was maybe 30 inches, uh, you know, big CRT. And I'm sitting in front of it, like cross-legged, like I'm a little kid watching Saturday morning cartoons. Well, you were I'm a little kid. I'm obviously a grown ass man, but, but I'm, I'm sitting there like this and as Mr. Warp fired and I just kind of went like right into the screen. I just was blown away by that. I will always, I remember what time it was. I remember, I mean, it was amazing. Well, I, you know, I had, I had videotaped the entire first season of next generation, you know, basically every week was a new hope that, you know, it was going to be uh, more like what we wanted. And it never really got there until about the third season. Um, but uh, I remember uh, when I watched it, I thought, oh my God, this is great. Particularly because of the character of Commander Shelby and that she was there to kick these boring people in the ass, basically. Because yeah. honestly, I thought that Next Generation was pretty boring. And, you know. I had really obviously come to like it in the third season, which is not to say there weren't worthwhile episodes in the first and second season. Remember, yeah, not at all. Some time on the sets at this point and, um, you know, was really trying to like the show, you know, and force yeah. myself. But then, you know, episodes like Who Watches the Watcher and The Survivors, you know, that yeah. season, really raised its game. And I was, I was excited about the show and obviously excited about the finale. This is the time of 26 episodes. But, you know, it sort of sputtered around towards the end of the third season. There were a couple of clunkers, you know. Didn't, didn't, um, I, I, I couldn't tell you specifically, but um, I know uh, that, you know, that was the season, I think, of the high ground. And, and there, was, there was a couple of clunkers. Uh, and then I think uh, Tin Men was that season, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so a couple of episodes, not, not all that exciting. Tin, and, tin Man. Tin Man. And then... Um, and then, you know, from the moment this starts, all of a sudden, you know, Shelby comes on and she's a whirling dervish and she's powerful. And let's face it, she's sexy. You know, we we're all in our 20s. I mean, she was uh, and uh, she she was um, she was she was great. And she was a powerful, strong person who knew what she wanted. And and it's like, wow, this, I mean, and this is a military ship. And it's like yeah. seeing their families. But this is how it should be. Right. right. I mean, you know, and and she's trained and she's competent. Yeah. And, uh, and it's really exciting. And by the time you get to um, uh, Mr. War Fire, uh, and then to be continued, and that wonderful musical sting, I don't think you can underestimate what Ron Jones did yeah. for this. Mm -hmm. So rare that the music actually was helpful to Next Generation. I think the music made it more boring most of the time. Right. And mm -hmm. Ron Jones just took it and he took this to 11. And then that dun dun dun. Dun, dun, dun. And I, I'll tell you where I really missed it. I recently rewatched it, but I watched that recut version that they did for Blu-ray where they turned it into a movie. Right. So it, it seamlessly goes, but it, it doesn't have the dun, 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 dun. And, and I, I much prefer that on the actual episode going to the cliffhanger than the sort of seamlessly cut version of it. So you uh, prefer the dun, dun, dun. I prefer the dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but isn't it amazing though that you'd think you know, as a as a fanboy, that that yeah, you take those two episodes together, you just watch them like a movie, and it's the same experience. But here's the cost: the cost of doing that is that moment that grabs you by the balls and squeezes. You know, of Mr. War Fire, it suddenly doesn't have the same power. Right. It's suddenly right. just kind of a moment, and it's not shot or or edited and conveyed in such a way in the in the in the condensed cut, so that the the outcome, the surprising outcome, lands in the same way. It just which doesn't. is 
which is why I always wait three years after watching Empire Strikes Back before I watch Return of the Jedi again. Same here. <laughs> the, real way, the real way to watch Best of Both Worlds is to watch Best of Both Worlds Part 1, watch the clip, and then stop. And just yeah. never Part 2. And right. just whatever the, you imagined in your mind. And it was kind of like Empire that summer, if yeah. you remember. Where it's like, oh, is he um, really Luke's father? And, um, you know, who is the other? And where's Boba Fett, you know, going to do uh, with Han Solo and all this stuff. And it was like that with Star Trek, too. Everybody's like, is Shelby, you know, going to stay on the Enterprise? Is Riker going to leave? Is, are they ever going to deborgify Picard? I mean, these are the questions people were asking. And it was, it was great. And it was great because it got people talking about Star Trek. Right. It was time. I really feel like since Star Trek two, where like people were like really talking about it, like right. the was covering it. And, and there were a lot of articles in TV guide and, you know, magazines, remember those. And they were talking about like this amazing cliffhanger and it, people. It was actively in the zeitgeist. Even the jocks were talking about freaking Star Trek, man. I mean, that was the weird part. Don't listen like, to the jocks. I know, but yeah, just like that. I had football <laughs> players, like who were like living in like this suite next to me. And those guys were talking about the end of Next Generation. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. No. Um, anyway, really extraordinary. I, I, I got to say, what, you know, it's funny. It feels like those 10 years between the end of Star Trek and the motion picture were almost infinity. So when you say it's 30 years between Best of Both Worlds and yeah. today, that's crazy. It's crazy. It's nonsense. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad because we have a great guest and, and people are really going to enjoy. We're bringing Elizabeth Dennehy to join us, who's going to talk about what it was like to play Commander Shelby and really great insights into uh, the role and, and her perspective, which is very different than ours as fans. So uh, let's bring let's let's bring her aboard and see if she can stir up things as she did on the Enterprise. Sounds good. Beam her aboard. And uh, joining us is Elizabeth Dennehy, the star of Best of Both Worlds, who uh, portrayed the very memorable Commander Shelby. And uh, I, I, first of all, I got to ask you, can you believe here we are 30 years later? I mean, this is crazy. No. Feels like today. I can't believe it. When I first, I was 28 when I did the, um, the two episodes and Jonathan Frake said to me, you have no idea what's going to happen to you because of this, do you? And I said, what are you talking about? No. And so, no, I cannot believe it. I didn't believe it then, and I, I don't believe it. It's, it's surreal. And what's remarkable is television is filled with cliffhangers. And, uh, but, you know, other than who shot JR, I can't think of a – certainly no cliffhanger comes to mind – has become as much part of the zeitgeist and, and become like sort of a pop culture classic as uh, that the uh, resolution of the cliffhanger for Best of Both Worlds. I mean, do you that's find... What, that's what everybody tells me, but at the time, I don't think any of us were aware of how momentous it was. I mean, they if certainly we knew that it was the first cliffhanger that Star Trek had ever done. It was the first time anybody questioned Riker's command. So we were breaking ground, but we couldn't have predicted that people would still be talking about it 30 years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really interesting because obviously I went back and rewatched it for in anticipation of doing this episode. And obviously it, it, it still holds up remarkably well, particularly that first hour and, um, and, and you're great in it. So I wonder if, um, you can tell us a little bit. Was it sort of the traditional uh, shows up on breakdowns? Your agent calls you, says, go in for this thing called Star Trek Next Generation. And then you read well, with a bunch of people. The, the very first convention I went to was in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was with George Takai. And I was absolutely terrified. I was so scared because I was afraid that the fans would hate me because I never watched the original series. I didn't know a Riker from Picard. I knew nothing. I was an actress going on yet another audition. And uh, I, I actually had disdain at the time for the whole sci-fi fantasy genre. It just wasn't my thing. I was more of a Brideshead Revisited, more into, um, I was a total Anglophile. So 
I was the kid who watched the six, the six wives of Henry the eighth and mm-hmm. Brideshead revisited and upstairs, downstairs. That mm-hmm. was my jam. I was a Shakespeare nerd and the kids in school who were into sci-fi were, I'm sorry, very strange. Uh, and <laughs> one did not really want to be associated with those kids. Well, thanks, and- thanks so much for joining us, Elizabeth. It's a shame you have to go. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, I went to an all girl Catholic school and the boys, the people who were into like Pink Floyd were scary kids who were into drugs. And so I was like, I hate Pink Floyd. And then as I got older, I went, Oh my God, they're an amazing band. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Like the, 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 group the the you know the the group that is something appeals to the group that circles around a certain culture can actually be off-putting right and so i'm sorry i know I, so i was terrified at this at this um convention that they were going to just hate me that there was going to be time for a little payback yeah that i was <laughs> like that I it's only different i didn't you know know what a phaser frequency or anything any of that stuff was before i just <laughs> And uh, and it was just another job. But remember, I was 28. I was really young and immature and stupid and foolish. And then when I did the job, and it was so much fun. And and then I went to the conventions, and people were so kind and so sweet and so welcoming. And um, yeah, so I was schooled. I was yeah. still schooled. <laughs> you know, the 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 ensemble of Next Generation, unlike a lot of shows, um, is a group of people people that actually got along you know they're in the third season you don't see that in a lot of shows as you know and uh i imagine they were very welcoming and uh, you know at the time you didn't know it because you hadn't done a lot but i'm sure being a guest on a lot of other shows subsequently you realize how unique that experience was it was unique but the, the other thing that's very interesting on any show every show i've ever been on there's the big a big difference between the last episode of a season and then the first episode of the next season, they are tired. And every show I've ever been on, it's been that way. The mood, the environment, Mm -hmm. where the show is in the hills and the valleys. Like for instance, I did the last episode of Brooklyn Bridge Mm -hmm. and they already knew that they were canceled. So that was a very kind of disheartened, despondent kind of cast. On the other hand, on when I did Seinfeld, it was right after they first broke the top 20. Right. It had been on for years and years and years and nobody knew about it. And the episode I was on was when they first, like people first started getting aware of the show. And so that was a huge energy, lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm and excitement. And so on Best of Both Worlds, the last episode of a season, they're tired. They're really, really tired. They've done 26 episodes eight days a week, the full on makeup, and they were very welcoming and very sweet. But then when I went on and did part two, which was the first episode of the next season, you know, they're rested, they've had a little bit of a break. It's a completely different energy. Right, T- totally. Um, what, you know, in, in, in retrospect, when you, you look at that episode, I mean, I know that Michael uh, Pillar got, you know, it's, it's, it's so sad how, you know, that he, he passed away, but he said one of the most asked questions he always got is when, why didn't you bring Shelby back or why did you bring Shelby back when he was being asked these things contemporary, contemporaneously? Did you ever think that, you know, that was a character that you would portray again on that show or was it, okay, this was a guest spot. It was fun. And now I'm moving on. Or did you think like the fans, when am I coming back? Well, the fans asked that a lot. I, at the time, you know, I didn't know uh, what they were doing. I, I did feel like the second, the second part kind of wrapped up my story pretty abruptly. And so there's been lots of theories being kicked around that I was brought in to uh, show people that they should re-sign for the next season. I, ha- I have no evidence to, um, to say that that was true. Um, I think it was... Uh, I think it was a brilliant story. It was brilliant storytelling, but nobody ever said anything to me. And quite frankly, I, I look at it and I think I'm not great. I see all the times when I was nervous, all the times when, oh my God, that line 
took forever for me to get right. I mean, I think that's very normal that you see all the flaws. Oh, I hate my voice on that. Oh, I can see that I'm looping. I, I can tell that 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 line is looped, you know, added in later. Um, so I only ever see the flaws and I think that's very typical. So it's very nice that people um, liked what I did and are impressed by it. But, you know, it's just a, it's just an acting job for an actor, yeah. you know, you go on to the next. And of course you're thrust into a situation, particularly as a young actor, where there's this entirely new language. It's almost like doing Shakespeare for somebody who's never done Shakespeare. Techno babble and all this stuff, you have no idea what they're talking about. And for somebody who didn't know the show and 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 didn't really know science fiction or care for science fiction, yeah. fiction must have been crazy for you. It was brain breaking. There's a line that I will never forget that I spent probably five hours. It's not about learning the lines. It's about saying them as if you talk this way right. and you really, really know what you're talking about to get that comfortable. And it's funny that you mentioned Shakespeare because I'm now a Shakespeare teacher at a high school. Loxa is an um, arts high school and I teach Shakespeare. And that line that broke my brain, I actually use in my class nice. because it, it, like Shakespeare to say, if you can say, separate the saucer section, assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion, like you know what you're talking right. about and you talk this way all the time, it's exactly the same. You, <laughs> and so I use that as an exercise for saying a lot of S sounds right. and, and separating the words so that people can understand what you're saying. And That's they love awesome. that. And, and, the, and the act of, like all actors do, is taking something that is meaningless and giving the inner life and meaning for right. you. So that well, actually, I pictured separate the saucer section. I totally see what that means. Assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion. Right. It right. makes total sense. You have to play the movie in your mind and actually really see what you're talking about. Right. And I think that the reason why Gene Roddenberry and the whole Star Trek world stands out is that actually makes sense. It's not gobbledygook. It's not nonsense. I did another sci-fi fantasy show um, that rhymes with the word charmed. And I asked a question. I asked a question once. I was a, um, a, a what do they call us? Elder, an elder. And I wore long white robes and we know everything. And I remember one scene where I said to the director, if I know everything, why am I asking the human all these questions? Right. And they said, don't ask questions like that. And I, I was like, wow, this is not Star Trek. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, the you gotta ask questions like that. The inconsistency of that kind of drove me crazy. And you would never have had that in uh, Star Trek. Right. If you're all knowing, then you're all knowing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. You're either <laughs> or you're not. There's not exactly. a there. Right. Why, am I ask, why am I asking her so many questions? And it was just, you know, exposition. Right. You're just no. mostly knowing. You're not all knowing, just <laughs> mostly. <laughs> like, You're a lot knowing. I'm standing on the top of the Golden Gate Bridge and I'm asking the human all these questions. It was very bizarre. So I think the consistency of the mission, of the, 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 um, the passion of, you know, Gene Roddenberry's mission and how that carried through all the iterations of the show was very palpable. Right. Yeah. Very clear. In I think that also uh, there's something else I, I found interesting in watching the show recently. You know, it's 30 years later and obviously what we find acceptable has changed. I mean, there's all this country, oh, it's Gone with the Wind. Should people still watch Gone with the Wind? Because obviously we look at it in a different perspective now. My argument would be, of course you should. You should also be aware of the, the history and, and the context in which it was made. Now, watching <laughs> Best of Both Worlds, there are a couple of cringy moments. There's that one scene where Jer... George Murdoch says, um, you know, uh, talking about Shelby, and he goes, you know, he says, uh, he's very impressive. Uh, Picard says, very impressive. He goes, oh, only an old man's fantasies. And like, this is supposed to be the enlightened 24th century. And it's such a, it's such a pillar kind of like 90s line. And it, it sticks out like a th or sore thumb and it really dates it. And even my wife, who's a huge Next Generation fan, watching it says, oh my God, Riker would never talk to a man the way he talks to Shelby. And right. I you know, if if that's something, you know, in watching it or just even at the time, it's like, uh, you know, you, you're, yeah, you're brought yeah. in to be, you know, not only a force, uh, uh, you know, of nature that upsets the apple cart, but you're also, you know, the sex symbol there. 
it's very interesting because when I first started doing conventions, uh, er, so you wouldn't believe how many people will actually raise their hand. I'm talking 30 years ago and say, I hated you. I hated you. How dare you? And you were such a bitch. And I was so taken aback by this because in my mind, I was just trying to get the job done. Mm -hmm. Riker was in my way. He was being Hamlet. He was being really waffly and indecisive. And I saw exactly how to solve the problem and cut through all the bureaucracy and BS to get the job done. I'm the girl in the class who always has the hand up, you know, the straight A student always raising her hand. Mm -hmm. Well, should, should that child sit on the knowledge and the wisdom and the skill? No. Then as time went on, I started hearing that less and less. And I started hearing even from men and young men, I thought you were awesome. I thought you were great. It, it, and just just goes to show you how how much things have changed in 30 years. I, and then the last few conventions I've gone to, I never hear, I hated you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized that people say that because if you think of somebody as all-knowing, you know, omnipotent Riker and and then somebody comes along and says you're not all that that's really hard to hear right. mm -hmm. and I'm really glad that I was ignorant of the world because I think if I had a concept of how important this was and how uh dr you know drastic it was I would have been too nervous and I was right. like what are you talking about I don't care yeah just no it, it totally because it, that's what would have come through your performance yeah. And the fact that you aren't like that at all, that you don't, basically, you don't give a shit about them on this on this ship. You just want to get the job done and you want to do your best for it. And that's what's so great. And as the actress, I was ignorant enough that I didn't defer to them. Right. And if I had any, any concept of the scope of what it was I was doing, it would have been harder to be um, in de in, you know, immune to the deference. Right. And I just, you know, I don't know, what, what is the big deal? <laughs> Honestly, when I went in the mic makeup trailer and Jonathan Frakes introduced himself. He said, I'm playing Riker. And I was like, oh, I thought the baldy guy was Riker. I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea who was who. That's Shatner. <laughs> it wasn't back in the day where you couldn't just pull up on YouTube and look at old shows. Right. You know, mm -hmm. this is, what, 1990? There wasn't even, com I didn't even have a computer. Right. So you, it's not like you could do research on shows before you got on them. I yeah. loved you from Go. Like I thought that uh, that Shelby and Riker had probably the most realistic relationship of any two characters in like the next generation, just in terms of the actual dynamic. Um, it uh, in retrospect, it very much reminded me of um, actual naval officers that I that I dealt with and kind of how they deal with each other. Um, and uh, just that that back and forth was just awesome. Um, I could I could have happily watch the the Riker Shelby show over the next three or oh, four years. Oh, that's so sweet. That's so sweet. I, I got to tell you that my first day on the job, Jonathan had worked with my father. So yeah. he knew my dad and he was like, my trailer is your trailer. Because of course I was in a tiny honey wagon and he was in a big trailer. And it's like, you need a phone, you need a place to sit, you need to eat or drink anything. My mi casa is su casa, just like open door. And so welcoming and so fun and uh, delightful and really, really charming. And here's something else that I don't think a lot of people know. We didn't have the second part. Right. When we filmed the first part, we didn't get the second part until right before because they wanted everything top secret. And I don't even know if they knew what they were going to do. No, they did not. They, so um, Jonathan said something to me, which I actually knew already from doing The Guiding Light is you kind of have to play everything. And I hope you understand what I mean when we couldn't be only adversaries. Right. We had to play that there was attraction or he was playing, I recognized myself in her. Right. And um, we had to play, leave the doors wide open for any possibility right. because we didn't know what was gonna happen in the second episode. Were we gonna kill each other or were we gonna end up in bed? I mean, we really right. didn't know. Or both. And, and uh, yeah, and <laughs> and from the, from the Guiding Light days, I learned that you would have this terrible fight scene with somebody and then the next week you're falling in love with right. them. You had to play, be a three-dimensional person, 
and really, really live in the moment and be open for everything. Otherwise, you'd look like a maniac the, the next week when, you know, you had to just sort of, I don't know, play every possible option as a possibility, I guess. Yeah. And that's so great about Jonathan. I mean, he hasn't changed a bit in 30 years. I mean, he is just wonderful and welcoming and terrific and talented now as he was 30 years ago. I mean, and and he hasn't he hasn't changed. Um, I wonder, you know, how much feedback you were getting from Cliff Bowl because Cliff Bowl, the director, was sort of like an old school TV director back in the day when they were traffic cops. Uh, you know, certainly not a, a, a you know a very visually um, uh, visuals were not his forte. I wonder if, um, you know, do you recall, and it was a long time ago, you know. He gave me, he gave me one of the best acting notes I ever got. Um, I remember the scene where uh, I'm saying to Riker, all you know how to do is play it safe. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man, passing up one command after another. And Jonathan is much taller than me. I'm five six. He's got to be six four, six three, or six four. He's a very, very tall guy, and you know, remember, I was very young, twenty eight. It was my first job get, arriving in Los Angeles, and I will see if I can demonstrate this. When I was doing the scene with Jonathan, looking up at him, I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow. Of, it, it, Cliff said to me, um, "When you get upset." and your voice goes up, you kind of look like a little schoolgirl. Mm. He said, I need you to plant your feet firmly in the ground, stand your ground, look him straight in the eye, you know, as much as you can. I suppose that's why. And then it took my voice way down. You're in my way. And that was the best note I ever got in my life because I was forgetting about how, you know, be having theater training, like on stage that might have worked the way I was doing, like really feisty and in your face, but taking it down and being really cool, it brought the camera into me, right. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Good my ground and, oh, it was the best note ever and it changed everything for me, for Shelby. And I, I you know, it's talking about that playing everything, playing whatever could happen. Somebody just asked me about, um, when they change, keep changing the phaser frequencies and we lose the attachment, it works. And somebody asked me about that smirk on my face. Like, you know, like I, do you know what I'm talking about the yeah. moment I'm talking about? Sadly we do. <laughs> okay, so that was an example of maybe I'm a Borg. Hmm. Maybe I'm a Borg in disguise to playing every possible right. adventure. Maybe it turns out I'm the villain. Right. So I wanted that smirk to be like, I'm a straight A suit and I get an A in Borg, but also I rock. It could have been interpreted right. lots of different ways. And that was all intentional. That was all intentional because if it turned out the next episode that I was a, a, a Matahari double agent spy, right. um, I wanted you to be able to trace that. Oh, that's what that right. looked like. Right. You know? So you have to you have to really be thinking all the time as an actor. You're playing like five different things at once all the time. You mentioned before uh, about your dad. I just want to say on behalf of all of us, um, deep condolences on the loss of your dad over the past uh, uh, couple months. And uh, we we uh, we are all uh, fans of his and of yours. But you know, we just wanted to thank you so much. To say was we were thinking about you. He was awesome. He was a great guy. And um, yeah, he was, he, he was 81. And when he hit 75, he really started to uh, physically decline. So um, it was the worst part was not being able to go. He, the, he and his wife live in Connecticut. And um, we wanted to, you know, my sister and I who live out in LA wanted to get on a plane, but there was just no way. Yeah. There was no way. So hopefully we'll be able to celebrate his life in grand style when this nightmare is over. Hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the first time I ever saw him was in foul play as a kid. And I, 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 I took notice of him then and was always a fan ever since. Obviously so brilliant and a much better movie subsequently. Not that I don't like foul play. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I ha you know, it's funny listening to you talk about um, how you were playing the role. Um, 
Boy, I sure liked your version of Best of Both Worlds Part Two a lot better. <laughs> um, because, of course, famously, Michael Piller tells the story of how, you know, he thought he was leaving the show. So he wrote the show into a corner, you know, knowing he wouldn't have to get them out of it. And then he, he re-ups his contract and has to come back and has no idea how to resolve this situation that he's put, put the characters in. And uh, it was sort of a thankless, uh, no-win scenario in a sense. Uh, you know, how you, you, you're facing an unstoppable foe and now you have to stop them. And that's, 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 a, that's a real challenge. And I think as you allude to, your character gets a little lost in the second part. And I think, you know, that's one of the most dynamic parts of the show is, is the um, Shelby character, which is so, so refreshing because, yeah. you know, the conflict was anathema in the past to Star Trek. And this was a, a case where two characters, as you said, really get to go at loggerheads and it's so refreshing and so interesting and, and uh, it, it's really interesting to hear, hear what was going on in your head as to where this potentially would go. Yeah. I was mostly concerned about not gaining any weight over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Barbecues. No. Oh my God. I had to spend the whole, because you picked up right at the, you know, fire. And then we had to pick right up there right. after three month break. Right. Wearing a skin tight spandex jumpsuit. And I was in New York visiting family, um, and I ate nothing but fruit. That was all I was concerned about. <laughs> was matching, match, and they had a new hair person. A new hair person came in, and she, you know, she was like, "I would have done something differently, but we have to match." So, right. yeah, that's fascinating. Hearing the the machinations of the, of putting on a show, it's it's great. Thank you. You know, it's so funny because you always think that. <laughs> are more, um, I guess, highly evolved than they are. And then I got on the set and I was really impressed by the Borg, the Borg costumes and everything. They were actually with all those tubes and lights and couldn't pee. But the other side of it is when we get hit, we literally are like, is that a three or a 10? You know, right. this is three, a 10, you go flying yeah. out of your chair. I thought, this is really how you do it? Did a stunt coordinator have to teach you that scale? Like, here's yeah. like the one, the two, all the way to the 10? Oh, they had to teach us the scale. And, uh, oh, yeah, I, I was surprised that they hadn't come up with anything more scientific. It's really funny when you're on a film set and, like, you've got digital now. And you. my son is a, NY, a film student at NYU. And what you can do, the technology and animation and, and, and CGI, and yet, at the end of the day, when that microphone is on, everybody has to be quiet. And if a plane goes overhead, you have to stop filming. It's amazing how far a lot of things have gone. But at the end of the day, you've got to be quiet if there's a plane. It's funny to me. Or a siren goes by. The basic rules still apply to everything. It's all, we're all doing a show out in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. I have to tell you a funny story about, um, do you, you guys know who Seth MacFarlane is? Sure, sure. Of course. So he did this show called um, Blunt Talk, starring Patrick Stewart. Yeah. So um, I am friends with Adrian Scarborough, who plays the little redheaded guy who um, who was he, Patrick Stewart's really good friend. And they are really good friends in real life. So Adrian Scarborough came over and he said, hey, you want to go to the premiere? And I was like, awesome. So we go to the premiere and it's at the WDGA the theater on Sunset Boulevard and nice theater, yeah. and Jonathan and Marina and Gates and everybody's there. And I sit in the row with all the Star Trek people who I had just seen days before at, at the convention. Right. And Seth MacFarlane gets up on stage and he's saying that um, he's a Star Trek geek. He is obsessed with Star Trek, knows every line, to every show. And his dream was to work with, um, with, uh, Patrick Stewart, and so when he got the opportunity to do the show, so later on at the party at the Chateau Marmont, I grabbed my sons, one's an actor and one's a filmmaker, and I said, let's go test Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> and I went up to him and I said, hi, um, so you're a big Star Trek Next Gen fan? He goes, yes, and I said, I'm Lieutenant Commander Shelby. And Seth MacFarlane looks at me and goes, well, that means you're Elizabeth fucking Dennehy. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man, passing up one command after another. <laughs> Battle bridge. He said every single one of oh my Oh my goodness. And yes. my boys, my kids were like, who 
are you? They were like, are you really cool? It was so great. And that could have gone badly. Right. If you know, it could have gone very, very badly. I was really taking a risk, but it was awesome. Yeah. If you had called him out on his, uh, on his fakery. <laughs> remember you that would have been so embarrassing he knew every line it was incredible That's hilarious my sons were so impressed <laughs> well if they're not going to bring you back on star trek they should bring you back on orville i think let's set, let's set the fine Absolutely. i would love that totally. <laughs> yeah. well this was a delight and i i just again I, I know we all can't believe it 30 years one of the great tv cliffhangers of all time and you are such an important and beloved part of it so thanks for taking thanks. the time to sit with us and, and talk about it of course anytime Great. i'm sorry we couldn't get to, down to anaheim i like going to conventions i know now I like going to them. Now <laughs> I, my first one i was scared to death rain check because yeah i mean we, we you know we, we were luring you down with dinner at morton's and the whole the whole magilla because uh and then it got canceled and then we said okay well we'll do comic-con then we'll just push well, we used to go to um my we used to go to nam every year mm -hmm. and we love we love we'd get a hotel room stay down there make a weekend out of it we love it yeah i was very disappointed and i even like going to las vegas we drive the whole way i make mm -hmm. my boy drive so yeah, no, I'm sad. I, I any excuse for a a good meal and a couple of drinks. Absolutely, I know. And and it, it's uh, San Diego. It's it's obviously there's much worse things going on in general. Uh, obviously, over a hundred thousand people have lost their lives. But it is sad that Comic Con isn't happening. It's such a special thing for uh, a lot of people, and and uh, it, it's just a sense of camaraderie. And particularly after the isolation of the last couple of months, it, it was something for people to look forward to. But I'm sure next year. Uh, you know, um, everyone will uh, party like it's 1999 again. Absolutely. So uh, I think there's going to be a spike in the next couple of weeks with all this protest. I think this was just, it's a trauma inside of a trauma. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're going through very traumatic times right now. Well, anyone who actually listens to science and listens to the scientists as they should, I think is expecting a second wave of, um, I think it's the people who think they're epidemiologists uh, based on their Facebook posts that uh, don't believe it. And I'll go with the scientists every time, but that's just me. So uh, let's look at Italy. <laughs> people who've gone through it before. Yeah. So, yeah. For evidence. Ex exactly. Yeah. And South Korea just closed their schools again, you know? So uh, the whole thing is just, it, it's, it was yeah. the best of times. It was the worst of times. And right now it's the worst of times, but uh, this I too shall pass hopefully. So I teach Shakespeare, we put together this evening of Shakespeare scenes and um, the world got canceled right before we started our tech rehearsal. So the head of the theater department and the principal were like, well, you have to put something together. So thank God, I was so clever to be quarantined with an NYU film student. Because right. I Zoomed, we Zoomed at, uh, all 33 of my kids, 14 scenes. He edited the whole thing together and uh, Oh my God, I'll never complain about a tech rehearsal in a play. <laughs> never this, was, this was so, so hard. But um, yeah, it's been very strange. It's been very, very strange. It's amazing that Zoom has become the glue that's keeping people together. You know, it's a weird sense of. You know, the day before my father went into the hospital, we, it was his first Zoom. We all, the whole family got together and had a Zoom. The reason I did it is because I was going to have him read King Lear with my kids because I didn't know what else to do with them right. with the show being canceled. I thought, I know, we'll, we'll, I'll teach him how to pull the text up on half the screen. We'll read the play. And so with his wife, we, we were teaching him how to Zoom and the whole family Zoomed. And then the next day he was in the hospital. And we're so glad, I wish I had recorded it. Right. He kept saying, he kept saying, who's editing this? <laughs> Who's the one? Who's deciding what which person is in the camera? Oh <laughs> Get him to understand that the computer has a camera. The the, wow. the, the computer is the new Dura, the new Kenneth Branagh. He's the, exactly. the, the new Washington Wells. It's it, the algorithm. Yeah. But uh, anyway, well, look. Thank you again, Elizabeth. This was great. And uh, stay healthy and stay safe. And hopefully, we'll talk to you again. Okay. Take care, you guys. Thank you, you so much. You. Bye bye. Bye. Well, that was great. Elizabeth. That was a lot of fun. Love yeah. her. Love her.
love, I, you know, it's funny. I interviewed her years ago for, for um, Cinefantastic back in the day, but it was contemporaneous with the making of the episode. Right. This is more interesting, <laughs> you know, having had 30 years to mull it over. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, after The Best of Both Worlds Part 2, I think everybody thought, you know, shit, I, I wonder if they're going to bring her back. I wonder if they're going to bring her back. And they never brought her back. Um, maybe after this episode, people are going to wonder, are they ever going to bring her back? Are they ever going to bring her back? Yeah. Well, you know, now that anyone can come back, apparently, I mean, so some weird people they brought back over the course of the, the series. And it does seem like th there's not a lot of desire to create new Star Trek, but just mine stuff that worked before. Right. So um, I wouldn't that worked. Why not mine it? I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I do remember talking to Michael, you know, uh, Pillar, who, who wrote the episode. And, you know, I've talked about this before, the, the idea that um, he wrote it knowing he was leaving and not worrying about how to resolve it. And of course, when he re-upped his contract, uh, he then had to figure it out. And that was really challenging. But one of the questions that he hated getting all the time, he, he would really annoy him is when people would say, you ever going to bring back Shelby? And he, 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 I never saw Michael, never, Michael never really got angry, but he, that for whatever reason, always pissed him off. I think because Shelby was there to put pressure on the Michael surrogate Riker. He saw himself as Riker and that's all she was there for. Right think he saw her as any kind of special character or anything it was just a story a plot contrivance and but i i think he was surprised and maybe a little disappointed that people like that character so much because they really never they hated that question whenever you had and it wasn't just me i mean it's like you ever gonna bring shelby and it seems such a natural thing to want to bring shelby back because she was so great in the role too but yeah. i mean at the time i wonder if they were intimidated by like a strong woman but then they created ensign row and she was great yeah, and then Deep Space Nine, all over the place. I don't know, man. Like, uh, I know I I, um, I don't dislike uh, Best of Both Worlds Part Two as as much as you do, Mark. But I think, because um, I, honestly, I I think where it really falls apart is the is the is the very very end. Like the right idea was Picard was kind of the the chink in the armor. Um, but I think that the for me the fundamental problem was that it didn't leverage the the conflict that had been established in that first episode. As much as I, I mean, there are things in that episode I love, right? I love Riker um, and his scene with Guinan, right? The you throw that book away scene. I think that's great. I think all of the stuff um, where the the episode is about that, it's awesome. But imagine a version of that scene with Guinan that's Shelby instead, right? Where that conflict, you know, of you're just, you know, afraid, you know, you just pass up command after command, right? Turned into, okay, boss, I'm going to give you that pep talk that you need. Right. And right. saying now I believe in you. Right. It's like you're now the great man and you have to throw that away. You have to get out of the shadow. I think would have been transformative. It's like it's that I think about that a lot because I just feel like that scene is occupying a place in their arc. Um, I desperately missed that. Character. Uh oh, uh oh, it's not good. Anymore. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I have to say that. Um... Uh, you know, I don't hate the second part. I thought it was a really challenge. I was a challenge mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, make that satisfying. I mean, I do feel it, it, it cheated its way out a little. The Q Kyushu, the Melbourne, he didn't have to make a decision because it was destroyed at Wolf 359, right? Right. So, eh, okay. You know, I, I, I but uh, it would have been more interesting, I think, to see Riker have to make the tough call yeah. that was to do. And uh, I would have loved to have seen you know, Shelby come back and see her advance in her career and him yeah. question his choices, like, you know, that he wasn't as driven, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, uh, but, um, it, but okay, it, that didn't happen. It didn't <laughs> right. happen, so forget it. You know, and, and the fact that really, I think, if you look at Best of Both Worlds, Best of Both Worlds, one, really feels epic. It feels like a movie. Two, mostly takes place in Data's lab or, or right. in the bay. Right. Once they grab the card, it's like we're sitting in the lab. Yeah. It Feel big. Nobody know, else knows what to do. Nobody else can do anything. That's the problem. It's a it's a structural issue too. I'm also, as you heard in the interview, not a huge fan of Cliff Ball as a director. I think there were a lot more interesting visual directors on that show. David, he, look, TV at the time was very static in general. But David Carson, Rick Colby, David Livingston, these are all guys who who knew how to move the camera and do interesting things and visually, you know. And I I don't feel that Cliff Ball Cliff Ball to me was like the interesting of, of all those directors i thought les landau did a much better job so um 
anyway, but that's just me. But this is this is super fun and happy birthday, best of both worlds. I mean, you could argue this is the show that saved Star Trek. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It, it definitely changed the perception so many people had. And for, you know, a lot of the people watching this, they probably weren't even alive when this came on. It changed the conditions of the test. Right. <laughs> well, any, yesterday's Enterprise saved the next generation, but the best of both worlds turned Star Trek back into a phenomenon that now it's 30 years later. It's a colossal waste of time. That's a real point because, of course, yesterday's Enterprise was third season. I think arguably it's the better episode. But mm, yet... Yeah. It's best of both worlds. That's the one that turned next generation to a phenomenon. And that's because of the cliffhanger. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, at the end of 26 episodes, you have people coming back and wanting more that fourth season. Or the cliff bowl hanger. Right. That. The bowl hanger. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't end, this, panel, <laughs> I can't end this, this installment of Inglorious Trexters without acknowledging that the best of both worlds also paved the way for one of the great next generation episodes that was about to come, which was family. Yes, right. Oh in 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 Star Trek, where they actually did dealt with the repercussions of Best of Both Worlds, right. and small, intimate story that, in many ways, you know, sort of paved the way for Picard, for better or worse. And it, it paved the way for Picard to completely ignore all those things. And it paved the way for all good things on the plus side. I uh, of course, did. Family is an extraordinary episode. Uh, J- Jeremy Kemp as his as his brother. Um, and, uh, and to see Picard sort of strip bare figuratively, emotionally, uh, by this rape, which is what it was, um, it it was really remarkable. And at the time, pretty extraordinary. And it was not, I know there was a lot of resistance to do that episode because it was, you know, Star Trek on earth. There was no trekking and resistance is futile. And it was so good. It was so good. And then of course, best of both worlds really paves the way for first contact. And we'll have Brandon Bragg us in a couple of weeks to talk about um, uh, First Contact. Uh, and that's a great show to, to look forward to. And speaking of great shows, um, we hope you enjoyed this fantastic uh, uh, San Diego Comic-Con at Home panel featuring the Inglorious Trexperts. And uh, if you enjoy uh, the Inglorious Trexperts, you can listen to us every Saturday, wherever you listen to podcasts, at Inglorious Trexperts. And uh, if you want to watch us, you can visit uh, your favorite app store and download the new free electric now app download that and you can watch inglorious trek sports every week along with the 430 movie best movies never made and episodes of such shows as leverage and the librarians it's 100 percent free and it's available for both mac and for pc and uh you should check us out on the electric now app um or just listen to audio podcasts wherever you listen to uh podcasts. audio podcasts yes audio podcast so anyway on behalf of ashley Darren and myself, I want to thank you for joining us for this very special Comic-Con at Home episode of Inglorious Trexperts, and we'll see you next year at Comic-Con, and hopefully next Saturday on Inglorious Trexperts, wherever you listen to podcasts. And I have just one thing to say. Mr. Wolf, fire. Dun-dun-dun. No? (laughs) Dun-dun-dun. Keep on trekking, Ingloriously, of course. Shh. Engage.